All right, uh, Isaiah 14 and 1 John chapter 3. Isaiah 14 and 1 John chapter 3. We'll start in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and 1 John 3. Isaiah 14, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, um, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now we talked last time about Lucifer's uh, reign and his fall. And in in this passage we have five I wills. Verse uh, 13, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And the thing that marks Satan and the, thing, the things uh, that mark his followers is self-will and self-exaltation. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he came to this earth to die for us because he loved us, because he wanted to save, save us. But even Jesus Christ as a man, we know he was God, but he was, also as a, he was also fully man. And as a man, he's looking at that cross like any man would. And he says, given the choice, I'd rather not go to that cross. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, could set aside his will to do the Father's will, then certainly you and I should be able to set aside our will to do the Lord's will. And the mark of Satan is self-exaltation and pride. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And the, the battle in your life, the battle in my life, every single day that we live in this flesh is um, who are we going to say yes to? Are we going to do it our way or are we going to do it the Lord's way? And uh, one's the path of the Lord, and one's the path of the devil. It's just that simple. Um, but what I want to um, what I want to do this morning, uh, the Bible says in verse fourteen here, "I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High." Now look at First John chapter three. First John three one. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So Lucifer's fall, his sin, his rebellion was exalting himself, and he said, I will be like the Most High. And yet in 1 John chapter 3, we read that our eventual destiny as a child of God is to be just like Jesus Christ. And, and at first glance, it would seem contradictory, but it's not if you, reach, you read each one in its context. What did Lucifer want? He wanted God's glory. He wanted God's praise. He wanted his power, his position. What are, we destin- what are we predestinated to be like now that we're saved? We're suppo- we are predestinated to be just like Jesus Christ in His character, just like Him in His love, in His mercy, in His kindness, in His grace. So Lucifer didn't want to be like the Lord in the sense of we should be like the Lord, like, uh, like possessing His character traits. He wanted to be like the Lord in His position, in His power, in His fame, in His glory. And one day we're going to be just like Jesus Christ. We're going to be uh, sinless, holy, harmless, uh, all those things, but we are not going to share in God's glory. Uh, the Lord said in Isaiah 42, 8, My glory will I not give to another. And uh, you and I ought to be striving to be like Christ 
in his character, not in his position, not in his praise. We should not be seeking the praise of men, but we should be uh, seeking to be just like him uh, in his character. And so what I want to do um, this morning is, is give a comparison because Satan is a mimicker of the Lord. Okay, Satan's desire from the beginning, he said, I will be like the Most High. And he fights against God very often by being like him in a deceitful sort of way. And so we did a comparison when we studied 2 Thessalonians 2 between Christ and the Antichrist. And I want to do something similar like similar to that this morning between the Lord and the devil. Now hold your finger, uh, you got Isaiah 14. It says in Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? So Lucifer, before he fell, before he rebelled, was, was given the title or the term son of the morning. Now look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. Verse number 16, Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus is the bright and morning star. Lucifer is the son of the morning. And, uh, and um, again, the devil likes to mimic or copy Jesus Christ for the purpose of uh, deceiving men. Now, a couple uh, uh, interesting note about this uh, Isaiah passage. If you have an ESV, English Standard Version, not the Holy Bible, English Standard Version, ESV, uh, Lucifer is not called Son of the Morning in Isaiah 14, 12. He's called the Day Star, Son of Dawn. Instead of son of the morning, he's called day star, son of dawn. You say, what the, what's the big deal about that? Well, it's a big deal because it changes the word of God. But look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter 1, 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Well, the day star is Jesus Christ, but in the ESV it gives that title to Lucifer. That's, that's pretty significant, I would say. Now, if you have an NIV... Isaiah 14.12 calls Lucifer the morning star. Well, we just saw it in Revelation 22.16, Jesus is the bright and morning star. So the NIV and the ESV both changed the word of God. That was their first error. But then the, the ESV changes it to a title of Jesus Christ given to him in 2 Peter 1. And the NIV changes his title to a title given to Jesus Christ in Revelation 22. In both cases, uh, these modern uh, versions, these perversions, gave the title, gave something that belonged to Jesus Christ to Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12. All right, get two, get two places now. Get Isaiah 9 and John 8. Isaiah 9 and John 8. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So one of the names of the Lord is the Everlasting Father. Uh, look at John, uh, John chapter 8. Verse number 43, or starting verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye, uh, why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil. 
and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the Lord is the everlasting Father, and that's, that name's actually given to Jesus Christ. He said in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one, so there's, it is the Trinity, it is the three in one, but yet it's one God. It's a great mystery, but I believe it's absolutely true. John 8, 44, Jesus has uh, told them, Ye are of your father the devil. So the devil's a father. The devil has his own children, just like the Lord has his children. And so once again, we see uh, the devil uh, imitating uh, the Lord for the purpose of deception. All right, uh, next one. John chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. John chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11. John chapter 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. That's a capital L, light. Verse 8, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus Christ is called the true light. He is the light of the world. And the Bible says he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So every person that comes into the world is given a measure of light. They are given a measure of truth. Nobody can say, I never had a chance. Nobody could say, I never had a chance to be saved. Everybody is given light. And what you do with that light will determine whether God gives you more light or whether he blinds you to the truth. But Jesus Christ is the true light. Now, if he's the true light, what does that tell you? There's something else out there that, that is another light that is a false light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 13, says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So Jesus is the true light. Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And um, the devil is not going to come at you with uh, horns and a pitchfork and dressed in a yellow suit, uh, in a red suit. That's too obvious. You wouldn't fall for it. Uh, you would see right through it from 100 miles away. He's going to come to you in an appearance of a good man. Maybe someone carrying a Bible. Maybe someone who claims to be religious. Uh, someone you wouldn't expect. Someone you would expect to be good and nice and kind. That's how he's going to deceive you. You're not going to be deceived uh, if, if it's not so close to the truth that it would take the word of God to decipher. You're not going to be deceived unless it was, unless it was, it looked like the real thing. And so Jesus is the true light. Satan is transforms himself into an angel of light. Look at Revelation five and First Peter chapter five. Revelation five and First Peter chapter five. Revelation 5, verse number 1. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So Jesus Christ is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, and particularly in, his, in the connection to his second coming. 
And uh, the reason, reason for that is because he's going to tear through the wicked and destroy them when he comes back. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Now look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan is, uh, is as, a li- as a roaring lion, and he walks about seeking whom he may devour. The difference is the Lord is going to tear through the wicked, at his second coming, the devil has the righteous in, its tar- in his targets. And, uh, and, uh, but the Lord's a lion, the devil is as a roaring lion. Look at John chapter 3 and Revelation 12. John chapter 3 and Revelation 12. John 3 and Revelation 12. Uh, Look at John chapter 3, verse number 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So you read back in Numbers 21, and uh, the uh, Israelites were being bit with uh, fiery serpents, and uh, and the Lord put a uh, uh, the Lord had told Moses to put a brass serpent upon a pole, and whoever looked at that serpent, the Bible says when he when he beheld it, he lived. And so the Lord's using that as an example. Jesus Christ is going to be lifted up on the cross. What do you have to do to be saved? You have to behold the Lamb of God. You look to Him, and you live. And uh, the, the Lord is compared to a serpent lift, lifted up. Look at Revelation 12, verse number 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So Jesus Christ is likened to a serpent lifted up, but Satan is that old serpent. Now, again... You see how close they are, not in reality, but in imitation. You see how close the devil is in, in imitation to the Lord? And so, we, why are we doing all, all this? Because, number one, it's a good Bible study, but number two, as you go through your life and you're trying to get guidance and you're trying to get direction, often it'll, it will be very hard to determine, is this the Lord leading me or is this the devil sending me down the wrong road? And uh, your only hope, your only hope to telling the two apart is strict obedience to the Word of God. That's the only hope you have. You can't judge it by your emotions, by your feelings, by the way you see it. The only hope you have in deciding which is the right way and which is the wrong way is the Word of God. That's the only hope you have. Uh, Look at Revelation 16 and John chapter 10. Revelation 16 and John chapter 10. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I, this is the Lord talking, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So the Lord coming back, he says, I'm coming as a thief. I'm coming to take things. I'm not a thief, but I'm coming as a thief. Unwanted, uninvited, unlooked for, for no good intent for the people he's coming for. Now look at John 10. John 10, verse number 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So Jesus says, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, destroy. I'm not the thief. I'm the good shepherd. The devil is the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. 
But what did Jesus say when he's coming back? He said, I'm coming back as a thief. <laughs> I'm going to destroy all the wicked. Whereas the, Lord, the, the devil wants to uh, steal, kill your soul, steal your soul, steal your eternity, steal everything you have. Um, but the devil is the thief. The Lord comes back as a thief. Uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 10. Matthew 24 and Luke 10. Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. The Lord's coming is likened to lightning coming out of the east. It's not, it's lightning of the sky, like the earth shining up the sky, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But it is called as, it is called likened to the lightning. Uh, Luke 10, verse number 17 and the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that, uh, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. But verse 18 is what we want to look at this morning. I beheld Satan as lightning, as lightning fall from heaven, and the Lord's second coming is described as lightning shining out of the east, even unto the west. Um, Acts 3 and Ephesians 2. Acts chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2. Acts chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Jesus, called is, uh, Jesus Christ is called the Prince of Life. Ephesians 2, verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Jesus is the prince of life. The devil is the prince of the power of the air. All right, Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. Genesis 49... And Deuteronomy 33. In Genesis 49, Jacob's giving a prophecy regarding all his sons. Uh, uh, well, look at just, I'll, let's just read the verse, 49.1, Genesis 49.1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you, in the last days. So these are all uh, prophecies regarding each individual tribe of Israel, specifically as it pertains to the last days. Now look at verse number 8. Let's see what he says about Judah. Genesis 49, 8. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not, not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So, this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ and the fact that uh, uh, they're all going to bow down to Jesus Christ. And Judah is called a lion's whelp. 
Now, what do we read about in Revelation 5, 5? Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's a prophecy of Jesus coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah, destroying his enemies and getting all the worship he deserves. Now, look at Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, verse 22. Dan, uh, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now, we won't run all the references on Bashan right now, but the, those uh, Bashan is connected with devils. And um, uh, not only is Judah a lion's whelp, Dan is a lion's whelp. Now, we, again, maybe we'll do it sometime. We, can't, we don't have time this morning. You run, you trace the tribe of Dan throughout the Word of God. Dan is the first tribe to go all out apostasy and apostatize. They did that in the book of Judges. They, they set up a, an idolatrous priesthood worshiping an image, and they did that all the way to the Assyrian captivity long before the rest of Israel and Judah went into idolatry. Dan was the tribe that led the way to following the devil. And, um, and, and there's many, many passages about Dan, but not only is Judah a lion's whelp, Dan is a lion's whelp, and it's an imitation of the truth. It's an imitation of what's right. And I know I kind of left you with only half the story, but we don't have time this morning to run all the passages of, on Dan, but we'll do that sometime. Um, look at uh, Acts chapter 4 and Ezekiel 28. Acts chapter 4 and Ezekiel 28. Acts chapter 4 and Ezekiel 28. Look at Acts 4, verse number 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. And they're, they're still against Him, by the way. This was a prophecy about what was going on during the time of the Christ, but this world's still against Christ. They haven't changed their position in 2,000 years. Verse 27, for of, a for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the middle of verse 27, He was anointed. He, is, he was anointed. He, he, he has to, whom thou hast anointed. Now look at Ezekiel 28, verse number 14. Well, uh, start in verse, I'll start in verse 11, get the whole context. Ezekiel 28, 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee. In the day that thou wast created, That's, this is Lucifer in the garden, before, uh, 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 in the garden of Eden. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So Jesus Christ was anointed, Lucifer was anointed. Matthew, uh, let's do Matthew 28 and Revelation 13. Matthew 28 and Revelation 13. And again, the devil, he's going to try to, he's going to, try to mess you up. He's going to try to devour you. He's your adversary. And without careful reading, and meditating and studying the Word of God, do you know how easy it is for Him to mess you up? You know how easy it is to Him to wreck your life or if you're lost or to, for you to lose your soul? You know how subtle He is? Genesis 3.1 says, The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. He's not obvious. <laughs> He's subtle. And again, the only way you tell these apart 
is the Word of God. You see how close they are? Look at Matthew 28, verse number 4. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. So praise the Lord, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Look at verse, back up to verse number 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So the Antichrist gets a deadly wound that's healed, and all the world wonders after the beast. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that just show the heart of man? <laughs> all the world wonders after the beast because he had a deadly wound that was healed, and yet Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and all the world didn't wonder after him. So, but what's the difference? One... <laughs> Wants you to, to, one wants you to live righteous, one, one tells you to repent, the other one says, do whatever you feel like doing, and so Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the whole world doesn't wonder after that. Somebody who doesn't demand holiness, somebody who doesn't demand that they repent, they rise from the dead, all the world wonders after the beast. So it's not a matter of, uh, it's not a matter of really um, intellectual knowledge or belief. It's just man just doesn't want to believe in someone that wants to make them righteous. <laughs> and that, that's the problem right there. Uh, look at um, Isaiah 30 and Job 41. Isaiah 30 and Job 41. And... Um, by the way, the, the devil does have power to do wonders. He does have power to do miracles. And if that's what you're looking for, that's what he'll use to deceive you. His power is no match for the Lord, but it's certainly greater than yours and mine. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. Look at verse 31. Isaiah 30 verse 31. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And in every place where the grounded staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps, and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Now that's interesting brimstone coming out of the mouth of the Lord, his breath, the breath of the Lord, kindling this fire like a stream of brimstone. Look at Job 41. Job 41, uh, um, the passage, the chapter introduced Leviathan, who is the devil. The whole chapter is about Leviathan. Verse number 19, Job 41, 19. Out of his mouth, Go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Again, how are you going to tell these two apart without the Bible? <laughs> they, they, they do very, very similar things, in many cases the same things. They, look, they, they appear to be alike, they're completely opposite, but if all you have is your thoughts and your ideas and your opinions and the way you see things, but you don't have this book as your final authority, you are setting yourself up to be deceived. This Bible is the only thing that will show you the difference between God and the devil. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 20 and Numbers 22. Revelation 20. And Numbers 22.
So the Lord, the Lord is the, um, in 1 John 5, 7, the Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So there's one God, but there's three persons, Father, Word, Holy Ghost. We understand that. Now, the devil can't mimic that. He can't be a three-in-one, but he can, he can do his best to copy it. Now, look at Revelation 20, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So at that time of Jacob's trouble, at the end time, you have three beings working together. You have Satan... You have the beast, and you have the false prophet. And Revelation 13, we won't turn there, but all three of those show up. The dragon, the devil, gives power unto the beast. That's the first beast. The second beast we read about would be the false prophet in Revelation 13. So you have the dragon, you have the, you have the devil, and you have the beast, and you have the false prophet. Now, the devil, he would correspond to the father. The beast, the Antichrist... He corresponds to Jesus Christ, and the false prophet would correspond to the Holy Spirit. And that's how that works. So the devil imitates the three in one. Now see it, we'll see an example of this in Numbers 22. Numbers 22, uh, Balak the king is, uh, it wants to hire Balaam to curse Israel. And he says, uh, and uh, we won't read the whole chapter, but look at the last verse. Numbers 22, verse 41. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. So you know, you know what? There's there's three beings right here who are trying fighting against the nation of Israel: Balak, Balaam, and Baal. Isn't that interesting? Now Baal is the false god. Balak is is the is the wicked king. And Balaam is the false prophet. So what do you have there? You have an imitation of that unholy trinity, the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. All right. Look at Genesis 22. Yeah, we got time. Genesis 22 and 1 Thessalonians 3. Genesis 22 and 1 Thessalonians 3. Look at Genesis 22, verse number 1. Genesis 22, 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So Genesis 22, 1, the Bible says that God did tempt Abraham. Abraham. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. So who's the tempter? Well, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, the tempter is the devil. And yet in Genesis 22, 1... The Bible says that God did tempt Abraham. What's the answer to this? Well, get Hebrews 11 and James 1. Hebrews 11 and James chapter 1. Hebrews 11 verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac... And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, Abraham, the Bible says in verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried. So you know what the Lord will do? The Lord's temptation is not a temptation to sin. It is a trial, like, like he put Job through. Job said, he said in Job 23, 10, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So, in temptation, you have to read it in the context. It can be a temptation to sin, 
That would be the devil's uh, operation. Or it can be a trial, like God putting you through a trial, like he put Job through a trial, like he put Abraham through a trial. But the, before Abraham ever, ever, ever carried out the act, the Lord said, wait a minute, <laughs> this is just a trial, this is just a test, you're not going to actually follow through with, with this. But that's the difference. Now look at James chapter 1. James 1, verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. See, temptation tried. Temptation tried. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So Satan is the one that flaunts sin, sin in your face. Satan is the one that tries to tempt you with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. He's the tempter of, with sin. God puts us through trials. God will test our faith. God wants to know what's in our heart. So, again... There's a difference there, but it's subtle. The only way you're going to know it is by the Word of God. Now, let's close with this. Get Psalm 91 and Matthew 4. Psalm 91 and Matthew chapter 4. You know, most Christians that want to justify doing something wrong, they always have a verse for it. There's always some verse that they pull out of, context, out of context or they wrestle to their own destruction. There's a verse in here to justify whatever you want to do. And um, why do I say that? Well, because the, the devil quotes Scripture too. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil... And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, see, if thou be the Son of God. The devil knows full well he's the Son of God. The devil, you know what he does? He just, want, he just tries to question. He just tries to get you to question things. Even things that you know are, of, of, are true and are certain, he always says that, he always tries to get you to question if, if thou be the Son of God. Well, he knows full well he's the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. <laughs> you see that? The devil answered Jesus with Scripture. The devil said, Jesus, you know it's written, right? <laughs> you know the Bible says, right? <laughs> the devil says, It is written. Man shall not... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I messed up the verse. Uh, verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. That's the verse I was talking about. In verse 6, the devil says to Jesus, It is written, talking about the scripture. He's quoting scripture. He says, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now where does the devil get this quotation from? Psalm 91. Psalm 91, verse number 11. It says, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, this is the devil, this is the passage that the devil quotes from, but he never quotes it accurately. He always twists it, he always changes things. What did he what did he do? What did he do? Look at Psalm 91 again, Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Well, the devil con uh, conveniently left that part out. In verse 6, he says. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. He leaves out in all thy ways. He leaves out, look, as long as you're following the way of the Lord, thy ways, then he's going to keep you. Lord says, well, he'll just keep, the devil says, he'll keep you no matter what you do. 
And so what does the Lord say? The Lord says, I will be your shield. I will be your defender. I will, I will protect you as long as you're hearkening to my voice. And you know what the devil says? The Lord's your shield. He's your defender. He'll protect you. And then he stops there. He says, go out. And the devil says, go out and do whatever you want because the Lord's going to take care of you. He's going to be your shield. He's your defense, right? He's your shield, right? Yeah, in the context of obeying the Lord. And the devil conveniently left that part out. And then watch what else he does. Verse 12. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. What did he, do? What did he say in verse 6? And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. What did he do, just do? He just added that little phrase, at any time. <laughs> at any time. What does the devil want to get you want to get you to do. He wants you to get something. He wants, he'll get you to do the right thing in the wrong timing. He wants you to get out of God's time. And this wasn't the time for the Lord to do that. This, that was for another time. And the devil says, he'll, he'll bear you up lest at any time. Well, this is not the time, but the devil just added that. Do you know what the devil does? He knows the scripture. In fact, he knows it better than you and I. And he will use it but he will conveniently take away certain parts and he will conveniently add certain parts and he will never give it to you truthfully like the Lord wants to give it to you. Now, look at Psalm 91 again. Look at verse 13. <laughs> Isn't it amazing where he stops? He, does, he's, he quotes verse 11 and 12. He misquotes it. And then verse 13 says, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Well, of course he didn't want to read that verse. Of course he didn't want to quote that verse. That's about his own destruction. And so what are we getting at? Whatever, look, the, the, the devil is your adversary. He is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But he's, he's going to come to you in a way that's believable. And most of us here, I think we believe the Bible. And, uh, you know, we're Christians and the devil's not likely to come to you and say, throw that Bible away, it's a piece of junk. Probably you're not going to fall for it. He's going to come at you with a verse. Out of context, misquoted, misapplied, to try to get you to justify what you want him to do. And that's how he's going to come at you. And you see in all these verses how close the devil is to the Lord. Not in reality, he's nothing like him in reality, but how close he is in imitation. And... He is more subtle than you and I. He is, he is smarter and wiser than you and I. He knows the Bible better than you and I. What do we have to do? We have to obey this book, meditate on it, read it, stay in the Lord's way. Because if you get off the Lord's way, you get out of the Lord's timing, then the devil's going to take you out. And uh, he's smarter than you and I. He's more powerful than you and I. We have no power against him. Our power is the Lord's power and His might and His strength.